There is coming a time where my Father in heaven will call worshipers of spirit and truth. Such will be the acceptable form of worship before my Father. See, when man gets a hold of religion with traditions, we start pulling all of that stuff out of balance. We can worship Him in truth. We can worship Him in spirit. We can worship Him in all kinds of ways that we invent. But the worship of spirit and truth is not accessible unless you look at the simple life of Yeshua the Messiah and you imitate Him without excuse. And that is all that this conference is truly about. We're going to talk about the Holy Spirit this day. We're going to talk about how can we walk in a deeper walk in intimacy with Him. That is what He desires to restore back to us. But before we do, we need to talk about the truth and what He asks of us in terms of the truth. Because see, we're, living, we're sitting here in a city. A city that was founded when a church was founded. This city was founded because someone started a church and that was truly the beginning of this town. And it's not a unique story. Many such places in America exist. Wherever you come from, where you're here or from far away, the story is likely the same. A story where, where we found, we've, we've, we've founded a country where on every corner there's a church. When I came here from South Africa, I was astonished at that, living in Virginia at first. Like, wow, these people must, must truly love God. They must truly be sold out. They have more church, church buildings than anything else. Praise Him for that. I mean, let, let, really, let's praise Him in that He has done something here. However, there is a danger when it becomes commonplace. Because see, in the first century, you would be killed for believing. Today, you may be killed for not by your family. See, it's become so, so common, so acceptable, and even pressure to believe. And so what ends up happening is we end up with churches full and hearts empty. And what we are now called to is true religion. And I want to ask you, what is true religion truly? What does it truly mean, biblically speaking, to believe, to follow Him in the truth that He is? Because see, ultimately, dear brothers and sisters, I want to submit that when Yeshua came, He didn't just come to die for, us as, uh, for our sins as the Messiah of the world. But he came to confront the religious system of his day. He came because there was a religious system that formed from a godly intent and heart from the law of Moses. People were reading it in the synagogue every Sabbath. But yet he stands before the crowds on the, at the Feast of Sukkot and he says to them, You are dry. You are like the wilderness you came out of. Nothing has truly changed. You're in this promised land. But you need something. Whoever is thirsty, come to me and have a drink and I will give you living waters. And not only that, but out of your belly will come and flow a river of living water too. You will become an ambassador. You will become, and it says, he spoke of the Holy Spirit when he said these things. But I mean, come on, like they had the Torah. Think about it. They studied it. They kept their Sabbath. They did all that. They had their seats longer than anyone else. They had all their good stuff in order, but yet he said you lack something. And I want us to first come to a place where we should realize that yes, you can keep the Torah as well as you want. And praise the Lord, he's given it. I teach it every week. Praise God for what he's given us. But don't think that that determines your position with the Father. Because whether you, like Tyler said last night, whether you know him and whether he knows you, that's what really matters. And whether you know Him will actually determine whether you walk lawless. It's not because you went and kept the Sabbath. It's not because you went to keep a feast, feast day. Or even because you looked away from a woman that day. It's because the thing that's going to empower you is Him. Because it's not just about keeping your goody two shoes right, looking like a religious man. It's about living a sacrificial life, empowered from on high, in all areas of your life. Not just in what you think is the way to your matter, but in what He says is the way to your matter of the law. To love and love your neighbor as yourself. Love the Father and love your neighbor as yourself. And so that will be the thing that keeps us from, ultimately, we can come here and worship Praise Him for that. This worship was so incredible. Thank you for your family. 
But you can stand here and worship Him and then go home. And you can stand in front of your favorite sports team and shout ten times louder for ten times longer, standing in front of the, the screens of Buffalo Wild Wings for as long as you want. You can do all those things, and you can, but it's okay because next week you're back in, at your fellowship looking ten times more religious than you did last week. So see, dear brothers and sisters, this is what the Father is calling us to. He's calling us to surrender because, look, I understand. I grew up religious. I grew up in the church in South Africa, in a Dutch Reformed church. We went to church every Sunday, all that stuff. I, our family knew God, so we thought. And then I came to primary school. Okay, I was young. And then I found myself in trouble a few times. You know why? Because I found myself speaking ill of other kids behind their backs. And when I really think back on why I did that, because, you know, I've always been weak. I'm still weak today. I'm the weakest of the weak. I'm the bottom of the barrel, lowest on the list, really, in comparison to man. Anything that I can do today is just His glory. I am weak. I'm nothing without Him. But see, because I was always weak, I was bullied. I was looked down upon. All this stuff that kids go through. And I thought that because of what was done to me, Somehow, subconsciously, I thought that gives me permission to put others down so I don't have to be as lowly as I was. See, whatever the abuses, the hurt is, the things that people will do against you in this life, do not use that as the license for how you abuse. Do not use that as the license to sin and the hurt that you inflict upon others. And so when the Father came to me, truly came to me, see, not just I went to church and I prayed a prayer, but when He truly came to me and I truly said, Oh God, I am going to give you my life. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to surrender. And oh God, I don't care what the cost is. Here I am. Send me. You need to change my wretched, wicked heart because I cannot do it. I cannot save myself. You must be the one. But Lord, in exchange for that salvation, I give you everything. And I will not let men, what they think of me, hold me down any longer. Even if I'm weak. Even if I'm bullied. Even if I'm hurt. I will let what you think, what you say, be the one who determines who I am. So I can live in liberty and freedom. I want to read a scripture to you, but as I do, I want you to think about this. What Paul is about to write in Timothy here is instructions to Timothy 3 is instruct or a warning against the against those who consider themselves godly so sometimes we would read this kind of stuff and be like oh yeah yeah that's the sinners out there right okay now he's talking right now about those who have a form of godliness and he says this but understand this in the last days are we in the last days yes. okay in the last days there will come times of difficulty for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, yet denying the power thereof. What does that mean? See, you can be godly, but when you live as this, when this is in your life, you have denied the power of the one you serve. Because what does it mean to be a believer? Let's just think about this for one moment. Look, we're breaking things down because we've never. We need to get back to the basics of what does it mean to be a believer? It means that there is a God that I believe in that is the one true God, maker of heaven and earth. And I am a less than a sand in the sea, on the, on the shores compared to how big He is. I am a speck in the universe. I am nothing compared to Him. And yet somehow He sees me even. And yet He then says, but I have numbered your, the, the hairs on your head. And if He has numbered the hairs on my head, what does that mean regarding how He has numbered my thoughts? What does that mean regarding how He has numbered my, my callings and the things? It means that he's more, He knows more about me than I do. He knows more about my thoughts than I do. He knows more about my worries than I do. He knows more about all of myself than I even do. He knows my heart better than I do. And if that's the case then, and He is who He says He is, and I am who I am, unholy, 
unappeasable, an abuser of men, and all of the things that we do, the wickedness of our heart, and He is so holy. <laughs> like, that means that there is something wrong here. It doesn't make any sense. And if I say that I believe that He is who He says He is, and He has come to do what He has said that He has come to do, then how can I be a pretender? How can I pretend before men when I know that He sees it all, even the things I don't, and that I cannot fool anyone? And so, some of you are lovers of money. When we think about the love of money, what happens is we start chasing money because we think that that is what is going to make us feel fulfilled. That's finally going to let us buy the next thing. It's going to make us feel like now we have what we have. But I want to submit to you that you can praise God and be, and be like, thank you, Father, that you never gave me the money that I loved because it was His grace. Because He knew that the moment that you had what you desired, you would forget about Him before the day is over. And so for some of you, you are struggling and I'm, this is not all, but for some of you, you are struggling because your heart is after material in this world. But the one who is spiritually rich cares not for the things of this world anymore. He casts those things off and then he is satisfied in the fullness of Christ. And God then can come and bless us because seek first the kingdom and he will provide the rest. He will provide your needs. But let's not fall in love with our wants. See, dear brothers and sisters, sometimes what, what has happened is we are in trials, we are in tribulations, and we crave the escape of the wilderness more than His presence. That's what happened in the wilderness with Israel. They had the tent of meeting in their midst, the tabernacle, where the presence of the Lord was. He was there with them. But yet, what did they say? They didn't even pay much attention. All they could think about is the melons and the leeks. They wanted to get out of a wilderness because it was hard. It's dry. It's, it's pressure. Some of you are craving escape from your wilderness and your trials right now more than the presence of the Father. Whereas if you sought and you crave the presence of the Father more than anything, that is the key to escaping the wilderness to the promised land. So don't let the fears and the, the things of the world pressure you into looking, oh, look at, woe is me. Look to Him. He is your escape and your freedom and your cloud that you can follow out of your trial. And so some of us, next up is proud. Because you have been hurt, you feel like you need to puff yourself up. You feel like you have this defense mechanism that you need to have so, because people have hurt you. But the Father is saying, come to me, let me make you humble. Let me, let me just wreck that stone heart of yours. Let it melt into my hands and let me do wondrous works with it. But stop, stop, stop trying to protect yourself. Yeshua did not protect himself, even though he could have destroyed everyone like that. He did not protect himself. He turned the other cheek and he allowed what came his way to come his way for the sake of the glory of the Father. Some of us are abusive, like I mentioned, because we went through abuse. Let the Father who is in heaven come and heal your heart, your trauma, your abuses this day so that you can stop the abuse that you enter. Some of us are disobedient to our parents. Look, I understand our parents have hurt us, betrayed us perhaps, perhaps even they're ungodly, Perhaps, but whatever it is, you have a Father who is in heaven, who is your parent, who is unchanging, who is perfect, who will never let you down, but who does command you to honor your parents. Who does command you to love them, to respect them for the parents that they are to bring you into this world. But let Him, even if you struggle to love, let Him come to change you so that you not only can love your parents yet again and forgive them yet again, but that you can love your enemies too. Because that's what He's calling you to. That one who backstabs you, who hates you, that who is who He calls you to love. And you say, how? By His power. Slanderous. Because you've taken your eyes off the king, you have put your eyes on men, comparing yourself, letting jealousy rife up inside of you. And so because of that, you speak bad about men, evil about men. But if your eyes was fixed on the king, man, like, if I, my eyes are on him, I don't see what you say. And even if I did, I'd say, oh, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. 
Father, they don't have context. They don't understand. They don't even know themselves because obviously they don't. That's why they act the way they do. And they don't know you. Father, forgive them. My eyes are on you. And the fact that you are bringing a greater kingdom onto this world soon. And what you say matters. What they say don't matter anymore. So stop Stop speaking evil of your brother and sister. And let me just spend one more moment on this. Because let me say that in the Torah movement, this, there is blood over our floors because of the murders that are being committed because we speak evil of one another. Because we go and we do not go to that person. And even of teachers, may I say, may I dare say, we say, it's, oh, it's a teacher. Oh, because there are many Torah teachers. Oh, there's a teacher. I don't, I don't agree with them. I'm going to go and because they put themselves public, I'm going to speak public. You know what the, the biblical example is? The biblical example is when they came to Apollos, when he preached and he did not know precisely the things of the Lord, and they pulled him aside to explain the things of the Lord more precisely to him. They did not slander the teacher on Facebook or speak evil. They went to him first. So whatever it is, whether it's a leader, whether it's your brother or sister, whoever it is, you stop the shedding of blood in your midst. Because I tell you that you you may just come before the Father and you may have done all the good things that you thought you were doing and He'll say, I don't know you, you murderer, get out of here. He will say that to you. Mark my words, if you do not repent of your sins. He will say, you murderer, you have spilled blood, you've caused divisions. In my midst, your jealousy have overtaken you, you refused to repent, you acted godly, I don't know you. Am I lying here? Am I speaking of some other doctrine? Or am I speaking what the Father has spoken and what He expects and what Yeshua has done? He is calling us to be a, into a new covenant, a, a, a standard that is even higher than the Torah, the living Torah. The one who says, Moses gave you a certificate of divorce. I tell you, that was not the Father's desire from the beginning. He is a higher, he's got a higher standard that He is calling us to. So if we want to walk in the Holy Spirit, let's start there. All right. Lovers of pleasure. Because we ultimately, brothers and sisters, lose our first love. Because we've fallen in love with something else. What is the first love? The first love is simply that Yeshua died for me, that gospel and I want to share Him with others. That is why you became a believer first in the first place. All those years ago, or if it was recent, it's because of what He's done for you. But then we get distracted, our eyes fall on something else, and we stop proclaiming that. And let me say that even knowledge and learning of whatever sort can take precedence over the Gospel. And then we fall in love with someone else. Because see, God's words are holy, righteous, pure, and good. But they are His words. Let's not fall in love with His words more than Him. You say, how can that be? But ultimately, these are His teachings. These are holy, righteous, and good. But He is a person. So, me and my wife, we have a relationship that is personal. I know her. She knows me intimately. There's a personal relationship. I I didn't just read a book about her. She doesn't just read a book about me. She doesn't just read my words. She has a personal love for me as a person. And that has to take precedence over everything in our lives. Yes, He is the Word made flesh. But do you know Him as a person? Or do you just know His words? Do you understand the difference there? There is an important difference. And so we as a people need to be someone who knows our bridegroom. And then lastly ungrateful the father speaks and he says look some of you are ungrateful because you don't understand what has been done for you and what is being done for you even as we speak Yeshua is in the heavenlies interceding for us right now right now as I speak he is there interceding for me for you and everyone in this room and meeting right now that's what he's doing and so when we think about that but not only that We think about the gospel in of itself. Now listen, I know that many of us have heard the gospel a hundred times, we think. But the the gospel has become boring to us. It has become something that we say, Yes, Jesus loves me, this I know. We sing this song, but let me ask you, do do you really know what it means? Do you really understand the gospel? Because when we talk about the gospel, you know, many people think about Him. Okay, so what He did is, He is 
perfect, holy, righteous, and good, but the most undeserving of the undeserving. He comes to earth, sees us with our wickedness and divorce from God, and He says, I have a plan. I'm going to meet them. I'm going to restore them back to my Father. And what He does is He, in, he it takes the punishment of us because we say, we, we trade Barnabas for Yeshua. We say we want the sinner Barnabas, but let Yeshua be the one to go to the cross. And then as we cry that out, His name to be taken to the cross, what happens is He's taken, He's butchered, He is, everything that happens, happens. He's on the cross, but that's not half of it. That's not, that is not even a quarter of it, that's not even one percent of it, because this is what people neglect to say. When He was on that cross, hanging there, with everything that was done to Him, all the betrayals, what the Word says is how it happened, is that all of the sins of the world were placed on His shoulders. Just like the priest would go and put the sins on the goats, now it was placed on Him. And what that means is that every sin that was committed, every sin that will be committed, every sin in this room, every sin of every person on the face of this world, every curse that would come because of that sin, Every weight, every death, and that is the consequence of sin, death. The death of billions of people. The, let me say it again. The death of billions of people were placed on his shoulder right there. That's why he bled through his skin. Spiritually, he endured that. He, and, and I don't know what that looked like. I, I can't say. But I just know that it was, there was nothing more severe there is nothing that can, we can't even imagine what that is like. And so when you think about what He went through in that, and He says to you, I do it because of you. I do it because I, it's all or nothing. It's all or nothing. I have to do it for you. Because if I don't go through this, then you don't get to know me or my Father. And you will have to. Die and be dead forever. You, you will never be able to be resurrected. You will be forgotten forever. Your families will be forgotten forever. You will have no chance because the righteous wrath of God will have to come upon you. But I come in your place and I will not, I will not let that happen to you, my child. I will save your life so that you can live forever. And because He was perfect, because He never sinned and never failed and lived the life we never did, He was raised from the dead. And because He was raised from the dead, He says, as I was raised, as sure as that is, that is the promise that you will raise, that you will not be forgotten, that I will come for you, that your family, your children, as they call on my name, they, I will hear and I will answer and they will be with me face to face in the kingdom of heaven. And it will not just be in this manner, but we will have worshipers of spirit and truth there with him face to face. And so when we think about that, this is not, man, is it really worth pretending? Can, thinking about that, can it really be, how could it be that we come here the same way we leave? How can we just sing songs and go home and nothing changes in the reality of this? Because for some of you, that may happen and I pray it doesn't. But do remember when you're, you're facing that temptation next week about the words of pity today. Remember what Yeshua has done for you. Because he says in Hebrews that if you trample underfoot the Son of God, in other words, if in relation to what he has done for you, you trample him underfoot, regardless, yes, yes, you did that for me, but you do not repent of your sins, then there is danger for your soul. Repent of your sins. That is the gospel. Turn to him. Give him your life. Let his power be the thing that changes you. And so, true religion, what is it? It's not just learning the next new greatest thing. It's not about realizing the earth is flat. It's not about, real, it's not about, it's about going for the orphan and the widow. It's about living a life that's unstained from the world. 
That's what the Word says true religion is, James 1, verse 27. But 2 Timothy 3, verse 7 warns and says that there will be some who are always learning but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. The knowledge of the truth is what? Yeshua, Him crucified, and the true religion He calls us to. God has given us responsibility with what we have here. He has decided, He could have done this a million ways, but He has decided that you sitting there I have decided to leave you behind as I go into heaven, as I ascend. But I'm sending a Holy Spirit because I, I, I could have, He could have just set up His kingdom right there and then. He could have. That's what the disciples expected He would do. Everyone expected that. But He said, I have a different plan. My plan is that you would be used. That you would bring the kingdom about. That you would set the captives free. That is literally why you are here. That is why He is there. And He is coming back expectant of that kingdom being set up as we prepare the way for the coming King, as John the Baptist prepared the way. Will you be a preparer of the way? Will you be, He said, the least in the kingdom is going to be greater than John the Baptist. Why? Because we are now called to walk as He walked and empowered as He was. So if you're sitting there, I'm concluding here. If you're sitting there and you're saying, Father, I need more of this. Father, I have lost my first love. Father, I have proclaimed the form of godliness but denying the power. Father, I have proclaimed Your name and I have secret sin. Father, I want to walk in Your Holy Spirit. Father, I want to be used. Father, I want to surrender. Father, I want to knock until the door is opened. Father, come and use me. I need your spirit and I need your truth in my life. I need you, Yeshua. I need the living water. If that's you, then I want you to come forward right now. Father, I thank you, Lord, that we will become a people that is so different, of such a different flavor. We're not going to just be a, another Torah observant lacking the life or something like that, some Messianic, some Hebrew roots, some Baptist, some Seventh Adventist, some whatever. Let us be a disciple, God. Let us be after your heart. Let us be a one that is a follower of Yeshua, that walks as He walks. Let us be that and not an imitator of men or, or an imitator of a denomination, but rather a follower of the one true God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and nothing less Nothing less, O oh God, so that our children, so that our children, so that our children can see the true gospel, see you for who you truly are, not we have, what we have made you to be, but who you truly are, according to the living word in us. God, come and bring that forth through our lives in the name of Yeshua.